We left last week at the end of the Tiananmen Square massacre with the Chinese Communist Party sending the PLA in to clear out the streets with deadly force. And as China was in the aftermath, Premier Li Peng introduced new laws that prohibited the questioning of CCP leadership through organized demonstrations. The new General Secretary, Zhang Zemin, also weighed in against the protesters saying, hostile forces at home and abroad constantly try to undermine our party attempting to make us abandon our belief in Marxism. There was also some other interesting news in the aftermath. The Patriarch of China, Deng Xiaoping, announced that he'd withdraw from any involvement in running the country and resigned his post as chairman of the Central Military Commission, though he kept himself in the fold by adding, if I have any ideas, I will convey them to the new leadership. The little man also decided he'd hand his responsibilities of military commission over to Zhang Zemin, making him the unquestioned leader of China. Hello there. Okay, so in this video, we'll be covering China in the 1990s. However, we'll stop at 1997 and save the transfer of Hong Kong until next week. And so with Zhang as the new leader, he actually took a slightly different foreign policy direction to Deng. Deng had been keen for the Soviets and China to end their feud and get back together. Indeed, Deng hosting Gorbachev was a major factor in the students deciding to demonstrate in order to get international attention. However, Jung was scathing of Gorbachev, accusing him of being in the same ilk as Leon Trotsky and that his liberalism was contributing to the collapse of the USSR. And Jung was also faced with the decision of what direction to take the country. You see, Deng's reforms had only been in place for a decade and that was short enough that they could be reversed. And so Jung had a number of conservatives. And when I use the word conservative, I don't mean American free market conservative. I'm not talking about someone like Ben Shapiro. I mean someone who wanted to conserve Mao's socialist movement. So ironically, in China, when I use the word conservative, it's probably a lot more in the direction of left in the Western world. That's the thing about the term conservative and liberal, it's relative to whatever country you're in. But Zhang had a number of conservatives in the Politburo, like Chun Yun, who wanted to scale back Deng's reforms, and some even argued for a return to collectivized farms. And so even though Deng wielded no formal power, he still had one final move to ensure that China continued with its reforms. In 1992, he went on his southern tour where he visited many of the Chinese SEZs and advocated for continued reform. He said, we should be bolder in carrying out reforms and opening up to the outside world and in making experimentation. Chen Yun led the conservative opposition to this, getting the signatures of 35 other leading CCP officials to oppose the peaceful evolution of the party. But knowing the informal power that Deng still wielded, Jiang Zemin decided he'd nail his colors to Deng's mast and also trumpeted reforms that had action quickly followed. The state council issued a 54-point decree to increase the freedoms of state-run enterprises, yet at the same time this gave the state more power in shutting down the unprofitable companies. Coal mines were particularly targeted as part of China's campaign to trim the fat and keep only profitable businesses, and this was a huge win for the reformists. And the reform policies kept coming. After Deng's southern tour, China's banks started learning far more and investment in planned and fixed assets rose by 30%. However, Chinese citizens made the same mistake as the Americans in 1929 and took the gamble of buying shares on credit and this created a huge artificial bubble where the value of shares in a company became far greater than what the company was actually worth. And as bubbles always do, the bubble popped hard and as the value of shares started to drop, people panic sold their shares causing the price to drop even further. The shares became completely worthless now, leaving many Chinese unable to repay their debt to the bank. But thankfully, the final effects were much less severe than in 1929. However, Chen Yun still used this as an opportunity to critique Deng's reforms. But the reformists were given yet another victory with the new Politburo appointments in 1992. Think of it as like a higher stakes version of a cabinet reshuffle that we have in the West. There were two key appointments. Firstly, Zhu Ronji became the vice premier and the governor of the state bank and Hu Jintao joined the Politburo having been tipped by Deng Xiaoping to be the one who would eventually replace Zhang Zemin. Hu had an interesting background. He was viewed as an extremely talented official with a photographic memory that also had good connections with the next generation of cadres. However, he had a very close connection with Hu Yaobang, who you can learn more about in this video, and he did not join the party's denunciations of Hu in the late 1980s. Importantly though, Hu Jintao was pro-reform and so a coalition formed between Zhang, Zhu and Hu, who all supported reform. The reformist position also strengthened when in 1993, Premier Li Peng suffered a heart attack and Zhu Rongji took over his economic responsibilities. And so as China moved towards the late 90s, the reformists had to deal with a range of issues. 
The wealth gap continued to increase between the coastal cities and the agricultural provinces, and corruption also continued to soar. For example, the Daiku governor pocketed much of the wealth that its 280 enterprises generated, and he drove around in a Mercedes and wore Pierre Cardin suits. Remember, in 1995, China's GDP per capita was 2% that of America's, and so many people became cadres because that was the easiest way to get rich in China. At this point, Deng's health was badly declining, which, you know, was kind of understandable given that he was 90. But his mumblings were not understood by most, and he only really communicated through his daughter. Zhu Rongji also took the approach to limit economic growth to 10%, to keep the economy growing at a steady rate, but also at a rate that made inflation manageable. He also made the controversial call to not devalue the currency during the Asian financial crisis of 1997. Other Asian nations were pressing China to lower the value of its currency so that they could more easily import from China, but Zhu opted against it so that it wouldn't get an explosion of foreign currency that would cause inflation. This won him the title of the economic czar, and he also made the call to allow private housing leading to the development of 30 million homes in just 10 years. And in February of 1997, Deng Xiaoping died. His death was followed by six days of mourning as he had an open casket funeral, and it was strange for China. Deng was the one who couldn't be killed. I mean, put it this way, if you've ever watched Novak Djokovic play tennis, at six different times in the point, it looks like he's going to be beaten, but every single time he chases it down and he hangs in there just long enough to win the point. And Deng had a similar aura in the political realm. He fought on the side expected to lose the civil war, and after winning the civil war, he was then twice expelled by Mao. When Mao died, Hua Guafeng tried to banish him, and even after he led and then resigned as the leader, he still managed to influence China through his southern tour. But the little man was now gone. Deng Xiaoping was dead. And once again, a new chapter in Chinese history was about to unfold. Thanks for watching. Make sure to tune in in two weeks' time where we look at the transfer of Hong Kong over to China and the beginning of China under Hu Jintao. Next week, we actually begin our new series, Enemies of the West, and we begin by looking at Kim Il-sung. We cannot wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.